three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us hustling and fighting. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to those of you on the internet listening wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe DeMar, and I'm once again live in studio with my co-host... Rebecca Wood. And together... I'm pretty sure. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah you look like Rebecca Wood to me, so <laughs> okay, good. I, think, I think that's you. Yeah. So uh, together, we're going to craft an hour here with your, hopefully with your help, of uh, amazing radio called For a Green Future. For a Green Future is where we talk about the ecology and the environment. We talk about them in the ways that they affect you, your wealth, your health, your happiness, the happiness of your friends and family and the, the critters and the birds and the bees and all those things that you see when you go out on a, on a nice little walk. Because we are all mixed up together in this one single sphere that we called planet earth and uh, everything we do in it c connects with everything else and affects everything else and do you see my roommate was post about the raccoon situation oh no what's what's oh let's let's have an update on the, the there's a little uh raccoon family that's been living uh close to rebecca's house on here in toledo go ahead rebecca what's what's the latest well nothing has really happened with the raccoons we still cannot trap them but um yeah the it, it turns out the the, uh, the the individual sneaking under digging under the uh the 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 trap to get the food was in fact an opossum a possum uh -huh. we caught him dead to rights <laughs> <laughs> you know possums aren't supposed to be that smart that's that's yeah. interesting that you're you've got uh, like a genius possum there in your they neighborhood yeah. so that means now you've got deer raccoons possums <laughs> right <laughs> all we need now in your neighborhood is a little bit of uh, jacks like a, birds bunnies squirrels mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so now we just need like an apex predator you know like a like a little mountain lion or something, and, and you'll have the whole ecosystem there. Well, you got the pit bulls, but, you know, they tend to attack other people's dogs, so they're not allowed off their chains anymore. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. Yeah, and uh, so this, this show, I guess that's sort of a theme for this show, is just kind of updating things, because uh, we're going to revisit a lot of stories that we've been following, because there's been developments in, in a lot of things. And uh, to that end, or following that, I... I our big news story last week was uh, talking about the the graph, the fateful graph that was put out by the NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, that showed, you know, that in this spring, as opposed to every other spring, uh, there was no drop in CO2 concentrations because uh, the inputs have been overwhelming the, the absorption rate, you know, the forest fires and the tundra fires and and now the news came out this past week that the amazon rainforest actually there's been so much logging that now it is a net uh, carbon producer as a, opposed to a carbon absorber it's a little like when you're just disposal disposal or what do you call that the garbage disposal in your sink starts spewing stuff out instead of, <laughs> instead of instead washing of it processing down the garbage yeah like yeah exposed to. it is and, and the reason of course the, the Amazon's become a net carbon producer, as we've learned on this show, uh, that there, when you cut down a forest for about 20 years, what happens is that the carbon that that forest has absorbed over the decades and over the centuries actually gets put back up into the atmosphere because the sun is beating down on the soil. The soil is where all that carbon is, and that causes it literally to evaporate up back up into the atmosphere so not to mention some extensive parts of it are on fire yeah. off and on so Plus that will we'll give you some carbon right there yeah things are getting burned and of course most of what gets taken out that lumber eventually ends up as uh co2 in the atmosphere anyway so i wanted to mention that because i put that graph uh for one thing that graph if you're interested in seeing it, you can just go to the noaa website uh, but if but I also put it on my uh, on the YouTube video version of this show that that I post. You know we have a YouTube channel, and so if you ever hear anything that you want 
to double check on, you can just go watch the YouTube channel. But I posted this on my Facebook, on my personal Facebook, this graph. Uh, and it was just kind of interesting because about 50% 50 of the people who reacted to it shared it, which to me says this is a really impactful post. A lot of, you know, when you get that high of a share rate, people really are, are being affected by it. Unfortunately, I only got about 20 reactions. And that tells me that Facebook has decided, you know, we're, we're not going to show this one to anybody, <laughs> you know, you know, show it to the immediate circle that I, you know, the people that always comment on my stuff. Opposed to, I have another post where I'm talking about my three sisters planting, uh, where I've planted corn, beans, and squash together the way that Native Americans did with, with actually putting fish in the ground before the planting. And that gets like a hundred likes and, and, you know, so they're showing that to a lot of people because it's nice and, and upbeat and, you know, not at all scary like this graph. But I think that it's important that we know that this is going on because uh, this literally, that could be the most important graph ever in human history, frankly. Yep. So we, we should all know about it. It should be front page news. It should be like on the Sunday shows here, I'm, I'm watching again on this. We've got the TV going in the studio here and CBS Sunday mornings going. And that should be like the whole show should be talking about this graph and what it means. Now, I, I did have a cousin who saw it, you know, one of my 20 people that they showed it to. And uh, she did point out that this is before uh, they have to do like recalibration and, you know, double checking of the, the data. This is the raw data, the un on uh, attenuated, you know, unstudied data. But typically, historically, those kinds of adjustments are really tiny. That Those just move the dot a little bit. And then this dot is, these dots are way, way out of position. So uh, that's one of the stories that I wanted to follow up on that or give you an update on is, is that the word is not getting out about this. And I, I think it's because people are really the people who know about it, the people who read graphs like this regularly are just so scared <laughs> by it that they don't want to talk about it. But, but you know, this we have reached a point where, where we've all got to talk about it, where every one of us has to do everything we can to, to cut down on carbon pollution or uh, we're going to be in, in big trouble. So I remember in the 80s at one point, uh, there was some woman on television or on the radio who said, I remember there was this one quote and she said, do you want a baggie or do you want great grandchildren? <laughs> and I remember thinking at the time, well, that's a little intense, you know, but no, she's right. <laughs> yeah. She's 100% right, it looks like. I mean, unfortunately, we, we that's the, the fate of the environmentalist is to be 100% right and be ignored. <laughs> kind of. Cassandra you know? all over again. Yeah, because uh, as all these predictions were being made, as all these climate models were being run and and they were saying, oh, it's going to get worse up in the northern parts and the s extreme southern parts of the globe. And, and they, they would always say, oh, and there's a little bit of there's a little bit of uncertainty. OK, it could be either way. It could be this way or that way. And of course, what's actually happened is <laughs> they were completely wrong in terms of being way, way too uh, conservative in their estimates. I mean, because what we're actually seeing is much, much worse than any of these models predicted. And uh, that actually is part of this, this story. And the reason I actually saw this finally in, in news articles is that they all underestimated the positive feedback loop effect. You know, and we've, we've talked about positive feedback loops many, many times. Essentially, the, the effect... They're actually not all that positive. <laughs> no, in this case, the effect <laughs> right. is negative. But uh, but yeah, but, but it's scientifically, they call them positive feedback loops because the signal keeps getting stronger and stronger. And, you know, the effect of putting carbon in the air is more carbon in the air. And, and that has been reinforcing itself. It's just, it is disheartening sometimes to be right so often and to be ignored. And uh, unfortunately, I have one more little personal thing that happened this past week along those lines. And uh, we've talked to many times about Bowling Green and how they're penalizing solar panels uh, with their new policy. The Municipal Utility Board has decided to fine solar panels uh, $4 per installed kilowatt every month and cut the amount of that they pay for electricity in half. And so uh, th this, this misguided, this wrong policy actually went into effect uh, July 1st, and I have in front of me a nice little letter 
uh, you know, dear customer, and effective July 1, we changed our utility billing configuration, and then they have all the meter readings and so forth, and then, and then you know, cut the amount that they pay for the, our my electricity to half of what they're paying for the dirty coal power that they're buying from the Prairie State Coal Plant in Illinois. And there is a, an important point I want to make here is that there's, there's this feeling or there's this habit that the environmentalists have kind of gotten into this situation where the feeling is that if some terrible thing gets passed, you know, some terrible misguided wrongheaded policy gets put into place, somehow once the bad guys win, you have to just forget that one and move on to the next battle because there are always next battles because they're, they're you know they're constantly they usually have to be fair got something even worse planned <laughs> so staving that off seems like a strategy you know right but it's but what it actually does is it, mm. it gives the bad guys it gives them every bit of ground that they take and so now so then they go to take you know the next bit of ground and so uh we're not going to let this slide we're not going to just say oh okay they got they did it they they got through that we're just going to let live with this no no this is a policy which is wrong from inception to uh to execution and we are going to continue to fight this and we are fighting it in bowling green we've got a petitions uh, petition drive going and i've been going out door to door and it's been very interesting because the majority of people sign the petition you know the vast majority 60 to 80 percent somewhere in there right because the bill the, the rule is a horrible horrible idea yes and uh actually what i've discovered is that our, our biggest problem collecting these petition signatures is people don't believe us <laughs> <laughs> no one would do anything that horrible you must be making it up right wow. exactly <laughs> oh my god right no bully greed's a progressive community we would uh, never right. penalize yeah. solar panels why why would we do that uh so so that's been a challenge but we you know we're we're gonna we're gonna continue fighting it we're not gonna let this bad policy stand because we can't frankly i mean tying it back to the graph you know this we have offset my household has offset roughly five tons of carbon with the solar power i've been producing over the year wow. that we've had them which is great but of course in the big scheme of things that's a tiny little drop in the bucket but if a thousand people in bowling green had had solar panels and if twenty thousand households in toledo had solar panels you know if we got up into those numbers now we're going to be kind of what they've got in like hawaii and australia where they have huge penetration of rooftop solar and they find that in the heat waves they don't need peak power that because the solar power produces that power for them so we're going to keep fighting don't worry and we'll we'll keep you updated on the the horrible things that the bowling green municipal utility board has planned for our future but now it's time to go to our guest our interview and uh in keeping with today's update theme uh, we're going to talk, this is the second time we're going to be talking with uh, Colette Atkins from the Center for Biological Diversity. And uh, they're doing some wonderful things trying to protect the wolves in the United States of America. And because they are definitely under under terrible threat. I wanted to get a, some, some uh, update from her and she was kind enough to record an interview earlier this week. So, uh, Josh, let's, oh, before we, just before we go to the interview, let me remind you that as soon as this interview is over, I know there's a lot of you out there poised with your fing fingers over your dial to, to call us. And yep. just want to remind you. Don't hold back. Yes. Do it. As soon as she's off, off the interview, you can give us a call at 877-909-1007. And we'll be happy to talk to you on any environmental issue. And you can also text us at any point in the show at 419-973-5841. And we will happily read your text on the air. Uh, unless, of course, it's something obscene, in which case we'll just kind of refer to it and, and joke about it. There we are. So, um, all right. So, Josh, if we could hear from Colette Atkins. Okay. Uh, hello and welcome to For a Green Future. Could you just share with us your name and title? My name is Colette Atkins. I am the Carnivore Conservation Director and a Senior Attorney at the Center for Biological Diversity. Okay. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm so glad that you invited me. <laughs> well, yep, our pleasure. So, Colette, uh, right now, uh, you mentioned large carnivores, and, and specifically, I kind of wanted to talk about wolves this week. Um, and wolves are sort of under threat 
nationally, aren't they? There, there's a lot of things going on that are, are sort of targeting and, and hurting wolf populations. Oh, that's right. Yeah, in <clears throat> at the end of Trump's term, he, his administration removed protections for gray wolves from the Endangered Species Act all across the country. And so starting with this year, management of wolves has been falling to individual states. And unfortunately, we've seen too many states that really are just dead set on killing killing wolves as quickly as possible and in really really high numbers so we're really concerned about you know existing wolf populations and in places like uh, minnesota wisconsin michigan and then in places where where wolves are just starting to recover we're worried that that recovery is going to come to a halt in, in places like the pacific northwest or um or the southern rockies uh-huh yeah it uh southern michigan actually is is part of our listening area so um i think that for a place to be considered truly wild you have to have the, the top carnivores you have to have the top predator and so you know until you've got wolves around you really don't have a, a fully functioning ecosystem would would you agree with that yeah that's absolutely right you know i i live in minnesota and you know i'm fortunate to to be in a state that where wolves were never eradicated this is the area where you know even after those intensive you know, bounty programs and poisoning wolves and a you know federal and local government eradication program wolves remained here in minnesota in our in our wilderness areas in the arrowhead region of the state then when they gained protections from the Endangered Species Act. You know, populations here in Minnesota grew and then wolves were able to disperse into Wisconsin and, and from Wisconsin into the Upper Peninsula of, of Michigan and wherever wolves moved to, we saw these amazing ecological impacts. I mean, wolves help their prey populations, you know, deer, by taking out the old and the diseased, you know, the sick and allowing the remaining ones to to breed and, and that strengthens the herd. But that also controls uh, really high numbers of deer, which allows our forests to be healthy by allowing understories, you know, like the plants that grow on the floor of the forest to be able to grow, you know, like these beautiful spring ephem ephemeral wildflowers that um, in areas with really high deer numbers just, you know, get chomped away to nothing and you don't um but where you've got wolves uh you see that beautiful diversity of understory plants that then in turn helps other animals you know the the frogs that rely on the insects that rely on those plants and the birds that you know it just and uh, you have that trickle 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 down effect we were making some some terrific strides in, in repatriating the wolf weren't we when when the endangered species protection was there wolves were really making a comeback in a lot of places yeah they really were i mean um, the northern rockies is a good example too you know wolves were reintroduced there to yellowstone and they're pop you know once they're protected because the wolves are actually you know quite resilient as long as you're not you know, shooting them, trapping them, poisoning them. So their populations, you know, grew from Yellowstone so that you had pretty robust populations in Idaho and Montana and Wyoming. And then from there, uh, wolves, because they're really long, they can be long distance travelers. You know, an individual wolf can travel hundreds of miles to, um, to try to stake out their own territory. So wolves there, you know, traveled to Oregon and to Washington and then eventually down down into California. And then, you know, this all just takes so much time, though, because you need to have this robust core population that gets to the point where where the new wolves that are born say, hey, these all these territories are filled up. I need to go go on a big adventure here to find a place a place of my own 
and we've got some just real amazing success stories even just real recently so for example in Colorado this year we had for the first time you know since you know almost 100 years we had wolves breeding in Colorado again and these are wolves that that traveled out from Wyoming and um and and found a mate and raised with their six pups now in 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 northern Colorado, and we're we're really hopeful that this will be the the start of a fledgling recovery population in Colorado, especially since um, there was a citizen initiative that was passed in Colorado that actually uh, requires the government to reintroduce additional wolves um, on state lands in Colorado, and that will be happening in some upcoming years. So we do have um, hope in a few places um, where we've got states you know, have positive attitudes towards wolves. And in Colorado, for example, they're fully protected as endangered species. Um, same with uh, California. But then in other states like Wisconsin, for example, we saw really awful things happening um, as soon as the wolves lost their protections uh, federally. We need to kind of review that, that awful thing where they uh, they opened up a wolf hunt and uh, could you just tell us what happened when they did that in Wisconsin? Yeah, so in February of this year in Wisconsin, it really, I just felt like I was just watching, it was just a nightmare, really, just watching this unfold. There was, um, the wolves lost their protection in January, and the 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 State Wildlife Management Agency in Wisconsin, the DNR, had said that they had planned to open up a hunt in the fall. But then there was a, a, a trophy hunting organization called Hunter Nation that actually brought a lawsuit and was able to force the DNR to hold a hunt right away in February. And they did this before any of like the required processes that normally would occur like consultation with um, the tribal nations there before um, reviewing the science on what the wolf populations were and and they they killed more than 200 wolves in two days and they used hounds packs of hounds to chase down down wolves they exceeded the quota by um, almost more than a hundred there. It really was just a bloodbath there and and showed, it was really just a prime example of how states can just erase so, so many decades of recovery in, in just a matter of hours if they're not committed to um, protecting their wolf populations. We definitely proved that, that humans are the most bloodthirsty species because we you know that i think the whole world kind of was shocked at just how quickly and how completely these these trophy hunters uh practically wiped out the, the population there there's some science that's come out now to look at the damage and um uh estimating probably that the population went down by about 30 percent in just two two days and i do have um you know, they're not exterminated there. Wolves will be okay um, at a population level. But I do think about the, the, the suffering that happened to those individual animals being chased down and attacked by packs of dogs and um, the exhaustion. They, they were running with snowmobiles. And it was just really, uh, just a really awful way to treat such ecologically important and really beautiful and intelligent um, animals. Yeah. So, uh, how how does it look at the other Great Lakes states? What what what's the sort of the picture there? Yeah. Well, in Minnesota, we uh, where I live, we had some good news really quite recently. I think, in many ways, Minnesota wanting to uh, not repeat the mistakes made in Wisconsin. Just uh, last week, Minnesota's uh, Department of Natural Resources announced that they will not do a hunt this fall 
uh, because they want to update their state management plan, which is from 2001, so you know a couple decades old, and it doesn't reflect the values uh, of you know today's Minnesotans or even you know the science. We've learned a lot about wolves in the last 20 years, and the DNR said that they're committed to taking a look at that science before they would authorize another hunt. So, so wolves will be will be safe this fall in Minnesota. Both uh, Wisconsin and Michigan, I understand, are going to be going through some, um, and Wisconsin's already started it, some public comment processes to take a look at um, for Wisconsin, what the quota will be for a hunt this fall. And in Michigan, I don't think they've actually started that process yet. I haven't seen any notices of that, but it was my understanding that if they do go forward with a hunt this fall, that they would open a public comment period um, and, you know, have some some places where the public could, you know, express their opposition to that. But I don't think I, that hasn't happened yet as far as I know. A mixed picture picture some places where there's hope for the wolves and it looks like they'll, they'll actually continue growing like Colorado. Other places where, you know, the management <laughs> is not doing so well, but it, it seems like that the, the shock of what happened in Wisconsin has kind of sent some ripples through the, the conservation community. Yeah, I think that's right. And yeah, we, we saw, um, you know, really some pretty bad things happening in the northern rocky mountains as well this year now those wolves have not been protected you know for many years now there they were um, removed from the endangered species act by a, a federal congressional rider but what what i think really may be emboldened by um by what happened in wisconsin both Idaho and Montana passed state laws there that um, would increase the you know, the methods available for killing wolves, like using um, strangulation snares, uh, allowing things like you know, use of dogs, hunting at night, using bait, um, using a, and so now the individual state wildlife management agencies who generally oppose that legislation because it really took away their discretion to be able to manage wolves um, using their expertise. Um, so now the, the state agencies are working out you know, how to implement those laws and uh, we have some hope that the Montana agency will show some restraint but um, Idaho uh, was just plowing forward and we're, uh, the conservation community is really concerned that we could uh, lose a lot of wolves in Idaho. So we've, the Center for Biological Diversity and a couple of our partners, Humane Society and the Sierra Club, we filed a petition with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to return federal protections to wolves in the Northern Rocky Mountains. And uh, um, yeah, and, and we hope that the that the Fish and Wildlife Service will, will grant that petition and, and those wolves will become protected once again. All right, well, let's all hope that. Um, quick question, Biden, President Biden uh, famously went on a children's program and said that he's he's in on protecting wolves uh, as a result of, I guess his grandchildren were, were approaching him and saying, you know, Grandpa, why can't you protect the wolves? Has that mm -hmm. translated into any uh, actions yet on the federal level? It hasn't yet, but we were all so very uh, inspired and, and felt so hopeful hearing uh, President Biden talk about, um, you know, that he cared for wolves, that his, that his own grandchildren wanted him to, to do the right thing and, and make sure that they they aren't so cruelly killed. And we're, we're hopeful that they'll, especially he's he has appointed a really good Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland. So yeah, we haven't seen anything concrete, but we uh, we have we have hope, and we've got uh, we have a target in terms of people should definitely be reaching out to the to the president and the secretary of the interior and and letting them know that that you care about the important ecological role that wolves play and that you've you've seen um, how badly states can manage wolves and that they really do need this federal protection. Okay. 
And uh, just real quick, you know, the wolves aren't the only uh, critters under threat here. Uh, the Center for Biological Diversity, you folks are protecting a lot of creatures, like, for example, the hellbender salamander. Um, yeah, that's right. You know, there's a lot of amazing creatures that just make this world a more wild and wonderful place to be. And unfortunately, we are in the middle of an extinction crisis. And <clears throat> animals like amphibians, for example, are some of the, the hardest hit because they suffer from, you know, poor water quality, for example, you know, pollution, habitat destruction, and then ec also exploitation people that will take amphibians um, <clears throat> out of the wild uh, for the pet trade. Hellbenders are these amazing giant salamanders. They can grow to be almost two feet in length. And, um, but unfortunately their populations are declining. They need really clean water. The center had petitioned to get the hellbender federally protected, um, but only a small population of the hellbenders were protected. So we've brought a lawsuit now to try to get broader protections for the hellbender. And that's really just, you know, one of, of many species. We, um, you know, the, the mission of the Center for Biological Diversity is to, you know, get species that are on the brink of extinction the protections that they need. And fortunately, the Endangered Species Act is a very powerful tool. So, you know, once they're protected, they get critical habitat designated and a recovery plan and you know, it's illegal to kill them and, and so we're just going to keep fighting for all these different animals that that are um, unfortunately declining okay well I'm, I'm glad you're there doing that and if people want to follow your fights and see what see what you're doing how would they do that. Yeah, I'd recommend that people go to biologicaldiversity.org. That's our our webpage. Um, we do have a new webpage we just launched last week for wolves called SaveOurWolves.org, and that's kind of a one-stop shop for you know, action alerts and resources, guides on how to engage with your state agencies to protect wolves. So um, either one of those web pages will give you a lot of information. Okay, and uh, just as we here on Four Green Future are dedicated to giving you a, a lot of information, uh, what did you think about what Colette Atkins had to say? You can give us a call at 877-909-1007. Do you think that we should be repatriating wolves all over the country, or are you like, you know, we're better off without them. Just, let's get, just get rid of them. Either way, we'd like to hear from you. Give us a call. And now we also, of course, love to hear from our sponsors Horror Green Futures brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. And there's several ways you can find out what's going on at the park, and there's always some sort of activity going on at the park, so it's worth checking out. You can call them at 419-353-1897. You can also go to their website, wcparks.org. And uh, I personally recommend downloading their app. Go to any app store and just search for WC Parks, and uh, you'll get some nice pretty pictures and of pe the people have taken in the parks, and you'll get to be able to find out what's going on. And, of course, they're on all the social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. That's the Wood County Park District. And I, I would also just like to make a pitch here. If you have a business that's at all environmentally related or environmentally friendly, uh, consider becoming a, an advertiser on For a Green Future because we really need advertisers. <laughs> And uh, people can support each other. You know, businesses can support each other. People of like mind can support each other. You know, if you've got that protected kernel of people that, like, help each other out, then uh, you're, you're going a long way towards ensuring that your business is going to be uh, continuing, that you're going to have a, a nice base. And So consider giving us a call at 419-973-5841 or text, and, you know, we'll tell you all about how to become an advertiser. And speaking of patrons, we also want to thank our patrons. These are wonderful people, wonderful individuals who've gone to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And uh, search for Four Green Future. Up pops our various levels of support that you can just pick the level that matches your budget. 
and uh, then you can uh, every month a little bit will come out of your checking account and come over to us and that is one of the things that's allowed us to keep this show going for oh over two and a half years now we've passed the two and a half year mark so thanks very much to our listeners and our patrons and our advertisers and now it's time for that part of the show where we hear from Rebecca. Oh, there we go. Well, yeah. it's it's uh, very definitely summer at this point in the northern he- hemisphere. And if you live in the northern part of the Midwest at all, Michigan, Ohio, parts of upstate New York, where else? Indi- parts of Indiana, northern Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, blah, 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 and uh, quite a bit of Canada also, this means you want to go to a beach in a great lake. <laughs> in fact, yes. around here, just to narrow it down some, it's pretty much Lake Erie, unless, you know, there's the quarry. There's also the quarry. <laughs> there's a lot of quarries. I have here. been to the quarry this year, yeah. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, so I thought I'd uh, look at Lake Erie water quality this year. And mm-hmm. uh, the most interesting thing that I found out about that was there are two very different stories going on. <laughs> One from the state of Ohio, from the uh, North Erie Shores and Islands Organization and the Commercial uh, Charter Boat Fishermen's Organization. Uh, captains and um yeah they're they're all saying that things are really great because because well they're because the lake's not green essentially it's not green right now so everything's ducky (laughs) um (laughs) well it's good that it's not green it is good it's not bad yeah Uh But so, yeah, the cyanobacteria is predicted to be smaller than uh, that it's been in decades in the Great Lakes. Uh, it's at a three at a scale of 10.5. I don't know why. <laughs> 10 point, why doesn't it just go to 11? I don't know. Huh. But yeah, this is according to the spokesman for the natural, the National Center for, uh, oh, yeah. However, and they're very honest about this, why they're saying this. They, they talked to the charter boat captain guy, you know, and uh, the, the head of their organization. And he was like, well, every time cyanobacteria gets mentioned, we don't, nobody, the, the calls stop coming in to rent our boats and they don't stop until the next year. Uh huh. So, well, they, and he talked about avoiding the stigma. We need to avoid the stigma in order to stigma. Which you know, he he uh, he's honest about his agenda. You right, know? that's true. <laughs> but it really I, was. I think it's also to important to avoid the toxin, <laughs> which can yeah. cause brain damage and and do all kinds of nasty things to you. So that also kind yeah. of important. Yeah. So the uh, spokesman for the natural uh, National Center for Coastal Ocean. Science says that this is actually mostly the result not of cleaner water or less cyanobacteria. It's the result of low water flow from the Maumee River, which is because of low precipitation this spring, basically. Ah, right. Yeah. So there are not less nutrients in the lake. Uh, the 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 mom the, the mommy is the lowest since 2012 apparently, and also interestingly, a smaller algal bloom doesn't always mean less toxins. The uh, let's see the, the cyanobacteria is the algae that produces the that actually turns the lake green, and microcystin is the toxin, and they think the toxicity may actually be linked to high nitrogen. Uh, in the lake. Uh huh. So, yeah. Um, overall, it seems to be pretty good. You know, you're not hearing a lot of bad stuff about bad stuff happen to people when they go in the lake. But yeah, before you go to your local beach, you want to look at the NOAA forecast website. Yeah, for individual beaches, you probably want to go look for posted signs for. Um, Parts per million. So far, it's pretty good. The parts per million of sewage is apparently good. <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, watch for posted signs. And also, you can go to the beach, the Ohio Beach, oh, beach guard system. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So look it up for your particular beach. Uh, so far this year, apparently, uh, they, they were talking about Cleveland. I, I used to be a big fan of Edgewater Park. I love that beach because you could go on the bus there. Oh, yeah. It was right in the center of the city. You could go on the bus, and it was where several neighborhoods kind of meet. So mm-hmm. there were yuppies walking their dogs. There were Hispanic kids playing volleyball. There were all kinds of African-American people having family reunions up in the picnic shelters, and there were drag queens playing frisbee. So <laughs> you could just see a little bit of everybody. It was a great people beach, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's been a big argument on the uh, on the internet this week for this one person that I follow about whether Americans are rude and inconsiderate because they like to party and play loud music at beaches or not. 
the Americans are very angry at her for saying this, you know, but, and it, okay, I can appreciate both a, a people beach and a nature beach, you know, because mm. I just decided not to spend my whole life being angry because I have to live in America. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, to, to be fair, you know, there's there's no meat sounds night at the disco, you know, <laughs> but you can really go to your meat sounds <laughs> is, in fact, the beach. But, yeah, some issues with uh, Lake Erie are... Algae needs to be reduced, according to Lake Erie Foundation, needs to be reduced by 40% in the western and central basins. Rules need to be uh, created to force all all agriculture operations, both like factory farming of livestock and, you know, crops that have to be fertilized to apply fertilizer at the agronomic rate. I do not know what this means. I am actually also not sure. We'll have to find out for next week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, phosphorus has actually been on the rise in lakes since 1995. And uh, there's also agriculture and manure runoff in detergents, wastewater, zebra mussels produce it, sediments that get stirred up, septic tanks that aren't working right, people's lawns, increases in storms are contributing to it, higher temperatures, and uh, nuke plant discharges that create very, put very, very hot water in the egg. Oh, yes. They're, they're, right. They're good at that. <laughs> so most scientists seem to agree that uh, we're headed for, the Lake Erie is headed for being declared dead again pretty soon. Uh, there's also a problem with dredging. You know, when they dredge out shipping channels or rivers or whatnot, they, they dump it in the open lake, and that contributes to the problem. Uh, it's got a big problem with invasives. Uh, some solutions to that, there need to be discharge regu re uh, regulations for ocean-growing ships, obviously. Besides the zebra mussels, they've got Asian carp and phragmites, which are some kind of a shore plant that's invasive. Yeah, phragmites. Right, phragmites. And uh, the Brandon Road locks, in particular, need to be fixed so they don't let so, so many Asian carp through hmm. is a thing uh there's a problem with mercury the uh funding for water quality monitoring, monitoring actually consistent monitoring stopped at around 1999 so it's just whoever wants to go out there and take readings apparently is all the information we have also big problem with plastic contaminants especially microplastic uh, b besides like causing fish to starve to death because their guts are full of plastic and they don't feel hungry, but they're dying. Uh, they also weaken the immune systems of humans, uh, lower sperm levels, cause cancer and developmental delays in children. So that's nice. So yeah, actually some pretty significant problems getting worse, but it's nice that the water isn't green. Uh, yeah, but it does sound like this is the time this is to get there because right Much. now it's, it's pretty good. So if you want to have some nice lake memories uh, get out there but th that also you mentioned that the requirement you know the need to put regulations in place to prevent runoff and things like that 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 over and over and over again ecologically speaking it, it gets proven that once you put actual laws and regulations into place protecting the environment they work yeah <laughs> and the environment gets better but as long no, as there more studies, I would always whenever we say, okay, can you just de declare it impaired and do this? They're like, oh, we need to do another study. We need a commission. All right. But but again, historically, if you let everything be voluntary, you know, oh, that the corporations or the farms or everybody will voluntarily cut down on their phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, somehow that never actually happens. And they did actually pass, like, a, I guess a couple months ago, a thing, a bill in, o in Ohio saying, that, uh, encouraging, monetarily compensating people. So rewarding the monetarily uh, farmers for not using so much fertilizer or something. So, eh. Yeah, but uh, we reported on, on that about a, a year ago. It turns out that that scheme actually ends up... Uh, subsidizing more oh great <laughs> pollution more more stuff getting <laughs> in the lake yeah it's special. <laughs> it's uh you know i'll i'll talk about the next the mechanism in another week but uh, there we go. <laughs> just paying people not to pollute that actually doesn't end up working no. okay so uh well thanks very much for that report on lake erie and uh i'd also like to ask the listeners you know what what's your been, experience been so far this year have you been to the lake how was it did you enjoy it uh, give us a call at 877-909-1007. Okay, so now on to ecological news. And uh, it's interesting. It's always interesting when the stories that we've got to talk about actually do match the mainstream media. Because uh, the first story we're going to talk about is the flooding in Germany and Belgium. Oh, boy. Yeah. And uh, probably you've seen the dramatic pictures and the videos that are all over the Internet right now of 
uh, entire villages get swept away, cars and mud and, and, and trees and buildings all kind of mix moshed and up and getting rivers getting, uh, you know, going over their banks, streets being turned into rivers. Uh, it's terrible. And uh, one way I know it's terrible is that they, uh, when it first happened, they were like, they giving the death count, like, oh, 50, 60 people, but with 1,500 missing. And now they're saying, oh, well, the official death count right now is 184. And they've changed from saying 1,500 missing to saying hundreds missing. Okay, 15 of hundreds. And I think, <laughs> right, that the hundreds... It's technically over 1,000. Is 50, yeah. Uh, there's, I, I believe there's still well over 1,000 people a meeting. hundreds. <laughs> right. Over 10 of those hundreds. Over 10 yeah, hundreds. Right. Yeah. But uh, I, I noticed the same thing back in the, the flooding in New Orleans, you know, way back during the Bush administration when... Uh, they they just started. They went from saying, "Oh, there's thousands missing," to saying, "Oh, there's a lot of people missing." Right. You know, and thousands is a lot. You can't deny it. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. But it but the effect is it downplays right. the seriousness. And what this shows, you know, this is an example. This is the story that's finally got all the climate scientists saying, "We underestimated. Yep. <laughs> we did not think this could happen at this level." Germany is quite literally up up the creek without a paddle, and there's some sewage in it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because it's flood water. Right. So that happens. And uh, so you know, so what's happened is this is this is the flood that has made the uh, climate scientists say we really underestimated the whole positive feedback loop. They really actually now are into uncharted, even unpredicted territory because they had no clue things could that get this bad this quickly. So. A friend of mine told me a few years ago that the, the Eskimos have admitted they don't know what's going to happen now. They make their they, they survive and make their entire living for millennia on figuring out what the weather is going to do. Right. And and they're very good at it. So and when they don't know, it worries me almost as much as when the scientists say that they don't know. Yeah. Well, but one thing we do know is that old growth forest can help. Uh, ameliorate all this stuff because old growth forest absorbs oh, carbon. <laughs> yeah, and and literally old for, old growth forest protects the um, creates microclimates that are wetter and cooler, and they they can literally help save people in, in heat waves because they they literally make the region the whole region cooler if you've got an old growth forest. Yeah, and so uh, we're gonna update our. Uh, Ferry Creek uh, situation, which we've had guests on before talking about this. Uh, the Ferry Creek is continuing to, the battle is continuing. The uh, number of arrests has gone up to 500, over 500 arrests. Number of encampments, the number of places where they're physically blocking the logging roads has increased. Uh, the number of people going out on the weekends and, and camping and camping during the week has increased. And uh, we reported, you know, Two weeks ago that after they had that record heat and, you know, hundreds of people died in British Columbia from the heat and that and lit in British Columbia burned to the ground uh, for a little bit there. The police kind of backed off and were kind of like, you know, maybe this is not so smart <laughs> what we're doing here, you know arresting the people that are trying to protect the last bit of old growth. We don't think we like our jobs very much today. <laughs> yeah, but they've apparently the, the length of time that that's effective is about two weeks because mm -hmm. they've, they've gotten very aggressive again they're 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 well, back out you know and, somebody might have found out they were doing that in applied pressure that's yeah that's probably true they probably got a, a talking to by by the sarge so uh so the rs rcmp royal canadian mountain police are once again uh aggressively taking out these these protesters but they're flooding back in and in, in even greater numbers so that's where that's going and again this is should be front page news but it's you know, buried if you could find it. And similarly, the line three in Minnesota that uh, has continued to uh, escalate. Also, there's there's I think we're around 500 arrests there, too. So that's over a thousand people arrested wow. uh, trying to protect the earth, you know, in this past year. This, so this summer should be going down in history as like the summer of environmental activism. But you know, no, but the, these stories are not making the headlines. They're not making the front pages. Uh, but so that, again, is continuing. Uh, Winona LaDuke is leading the 
the fight and they are having uh, events on either side of the Mississippi because this line crosses the Mississippi twice. And so if it starts leaking, that pretty much ruins the drinking water and the farming water for millions upon millions of people. Uh, so that, that fight is continuing. And then, uh, so the last story I have prepared, I, I wanted to finish on an upbeat note. And this, this was a good story, but it, you know, it immediately got overwhelmed by the bad environmental news. But it's worth going back and, and remembering this. This is a nice story. Uh, the Tongass National Forest in Alaska, the largest intact temperate rainforest in the world. The uh, Trump administration in the final days decided to open it all up for logging. <laughs> no, brother. They said, we're just going to go ahead and log that sucker. Uh, and uh, what's happened is the Biden administration has announced that they're going to reverse the Trump reversal of protections. So in other words, they're going to uh, re-protect uh, 16.7 million acres from old, of logging from old growth. They're going to uh, prevent the building of new roads in the Tongass National Wildlife Refuge. And so this is really good news that, that they're going back and they're going to protect that again. He gets an attaboy. He does get an attaboy for that. that. That is a good one. Now, of course, looked at in the big picture, this would be considered reversing a loss <laughs> as opposed to an actual win because right, yeah, at that's the end of the, the problem. Yeah, at the end of the day we're back to the old status quo as opposed to expanding the protections for old growth uh, right now there should be a national moratorium on any old growth logging anywhere in the country because as we know as we now know those patches of old growth are our best method of absorbing carbon in, in the world. I mean, they talk about the theoretical uh, capture and sequestration of carbon, you know, where they are going to make these big machines with fans. It's going to suck carbon out of the air. And then once we've got it, we're going to stick it somewhere, like pump it back into the ground or something. A, that's all theoretical. <laughs> yeah, we've been talking about that for what, like at least a decade or two, and it's still not happening. No, about 30. You know, where, where is this, where is this going to? Yeah, it's about 30 years. When is the technology going to come and save us? This is the time if you're actually going to do that. Right. But luckily, the biological technology, the, right. the actual nature, uh, does have an extremely effective carbon capture. Right. You know, they, the, the, the old growths absorb carbon like crazy. And, uh, you know, as we know from our little graph from NOAA, that's what we need to be doing. And so so this is good news from the Biden administration. They're, they're stepping up and putting things right back the way they were. But that is no longer good enough. <laughs> yeah. No, we've, we've got to stop logging old growth everywhere in North America, Canada and the U.S. And it needs to happen yesterday basically because the problem is that the pattern has been things get drastically worse under one administration then they get some of that gets restored to almost as good as it was before the disaster happened in the next one right and then and the, the, but the overall trajectory is wrong and yeah yeah so they're not doing enough the the so-called good guys are not doing enough to save us from the bad guys <laughs> right and and from physics i mean because ultimately this right. is what we're fighting we're, we're fighting physics <laughs> carbon carbon does smart because physics is gonna win every time yeah usually <laughs> usually physics wins when you try to fight physics i mean unless you have superpowers, which, uh, as far as I know, none of us do. I mean, if you do, give us a call eh? <laughs> and let's hear about them. No, just just kidding, because we're pretty much out of time here. But uh, I did want to end on that upbeat note. I want to give Biden credit when he does do something good. If your superpower is sucking up carbon, you might need a tree. <laughs> How are you using the telephone? <laughs> Good questions. Good questions. All right. Well, that's it for this show. And I, I wanted to thank Mick Gonzalez for the nice uh, lead in he gave us there. Indeed. For, and for the cheap seats. Nice and, fellow. You know, we used to be ahead of him, so I would pump his show. But now he's ahead of us, and so he's very graciously pumping our show, which is wonderful. And uh, stick around. There's uh, going to be uh, the money show, I believe, is coming up next, which is worth listening to if you're a person with money. Uh, and uh, I just want to say thank you all for listening. And this is Joe Damar and Rebecca Wood. And we are signing off. <laughs>